Well, good morning, everyone. Glad to see you back here this morning for our chapel. I want to remind you of our brown bag after chapel uh, in Todd 114 today, in Todd 114, and also tomorrow and Friday, same location for the rest of the week. And we do have uh, free pizza and water for those that show. So hopefully we'll see a lot of you get a chance to interact personally with Dr. Strack and uh, discuss with him some things I'm sure that he will uh, kind of tweak your interest as he speaks to us today. Leadership in government, business, and educational entities proclaim Dr. Strack to be a dynamic communicator and author. As president and founder of Student Leadership University, the premier global leadership training for students, he has successfully merged the classroom with behind the scenes edutainment experiences in Orlando, San Diego, San Antonio, Washington, DC, England, Israel, Jordan, Palestine, Italy, Greece, Turkey, Spain. You need to add a few more there, uh, Dr. Streck. Africa now, Kenya, yeah, there you go. Thus providing customized environment for learning. After more than 30 years of volunteerism as a speaker in high schools and universities, that has given him a unique understanding and perspective to inspire students. Jay speaks to students in the same way he presents to major corporations and professional sports teams, believing that if we give them the right tools, students can soar into future tense thinking and influence as leaders. Having prevailed over drug addiction and an abusive childhood, Jay believes, if I can overcome the past and believe in the future, anyone can. Your dreams determine your destiny. Welcome Dr. Jay Strack to the platform today. Well, thank you, Dr. Sedwick. We've got several Dr. J's. In fact, you've got a lot of Dr. J's running around here. I have a prized possession in my game room. I do speak to a lot of pro teams, but uh, I have a pair of shoes about this big signed by Dr. Julius Irving. He was a little tacky. He said to Dr. J, from the original uh, Dr. J. All right? So that was pretty cool, I thought. Thank you, Dr. J. That was that was a pretty good introduction, really. I'm not the best, but pretty good. The, where I was not long ago, the guy that was supposed to introduce me didn't show up, so I introduced myself. That was probably the best uh, introduction that I'd uh, ever been given. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me be real straight up with you. Uh, I live in Orlando, so I flew here at my own expense, put myself up at my own expense, rented a car at my own expense, and came. Now, I don't think I've ever said that to a group before, except I really feel I want you to hear this. I think you're a big deal. I've been doing this 41 years. I know I look way too young, but uh, <laughs> I'm old but cool. Uh, and the therapist said I could talk about it. Uh, but anyway, we won't, we won't go into all that. But I've been doing this 41 years, and I, I got to thinking, Last night it was late, flight was late, rental car lines were, you know, one of those deals. And, uh, and I was pumped about coming to Dallas Theological Seminary. When you've been around, been around for a while, you know that uh, DTS's fingerprints are all over the kingdom. Now, I am privileged to know some of your faculty, some quite well, and I know they think you're a big deal. And I know, because I know my schedule and what all's going on right now, hopefully, obviously, you think that I think you're a big deal. The challenge is, for those who devote their lives to trying to help men and women, young and old, to never settle but to soar, is that our greatest disappointment is that you very seldom get those sitting in front of you who think of as much of themselves as you think about them. In other words, you have professors here who've got credentials. In fact, frankly, I get a lot of opportunities. I can't carry a lot of their briefcases. And yet I know what professors get paid. And I just want to be straight with you. There's a lot of folks. I know that some of the folks on the lineup are going to be here in the next 10 days. They think you're a big deal. But having been at over 135 colleges and universities and and virtually all the seminaries, or most of the major seminaries in the world, sometimes many times, I very seldom sense that sometimes the students really have a sense of destiny, like those who come to speak believe about them, or that the professors 
ministration believe about them. Does that make sense? Because the problem is we know ourselves pretty good. We know what we struggle with. We know our doubts. We know we're tired. We know other pressures we've got. We know there's 101 things on our mind right now, even while we sit at chapel. And so sometimes we have a lid on us. And there's a lot of lids that life will put on you. And there are other people that will put a lid on you. The most destructive lid I know of are the lids we put on ourselves. So my prayer today, and that, was, that either was an insightful statement or it was a swing and a miss. And I'm very gifted in both, by the way. <laughs> I strike out far more than I hit home runs, all right? But, uh, so Babe Ruth. All right, but anyway. <laughs> But I want you to just have a sense this morning when I share with you, I mean what I say, and my prayer is the Lord will burn in you. This is not a game. This is the highest calling on the planet. I had a young man in my office and we were going over schedule and I had a meeting coming up in Cupertino. I've got another one coming up at Pebble Beach. I'm gonna be in five or six mega churches. Uh, I'm, I've got another trip coming up to China. And right in the middle of all that was DTS. You know which one he was the most excited about? Tell me what you're going to be doing at Cupertino. And of course, many of you hopefully know that's the mothership, right, for Apple. But uh, I, I want you to know he was far more excited about what could come out of a meeting at Cupertino than, and by the way, he's a seminary graduate, a meeting at DTS. But ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of cool assignments you may get. There's a lot of things that look, wow, that'd be interesting. But I promise you, as an old guy, I've been doing it a long time, what could happen in this room makes everything else pale in comparison. Or it can be another chapel. And we'll walk out. Yeah, that was good. You'll discuss it, you know, if you like that, didn't like that. You know how we do about chapel speakers, right? And then uh, we'll go to the brown bag. It's free pizza, right? Free pizza. Like we haven't had nine tons of that and <laughs> crave nine more at lunch. All right, so I hope you have a lot. So I want us to just simply ask God himself to show you how he feels about your future and how some other people that God is putting in your life feels about your future. Fair enough? Let's pray. Lord, I ask you to give me fresh oil today. Thank you for the privilege of being here. I pray you would light me on fire and light these men and women on fire. Whatever you've called them to do, imagine we get to be a forerunner, just like John the Baptist, preparing the way just like John the Baptist, preparing a generation, just like John the Baptist. But Lord, just like John the Baptist, we've got to be prepared ourselves before we can prepare anyone else. In Jesus' name, amen. Capturing the future. Now, I know my English majors will frown a little bit. It's not good form to have a gerund in a title. You shouldn't have a word ending in I-N-G, so I want all my folks who know about that, and God help you, uh, if you even know about that. But I want you to understand, you don't just capture the future once and for all. It is a pursuit, and it is something you're going to be doing the rest of your ministry. How do you capture the future? And more importantly, how do you capture your future? The Gospel of John, chapter 1, very familiar passage of Scripture. There's some questions that every one of us have to ask. And these were the questions that were asked John the Baptist when he began his ministry. He appeared, and this man on fire in the desert, and folks came from hundreds of miles to watch him burn. Three questions that you and I have to ask ourselves, and three questions that everyone you'll ever minister to is going to demand you be able to answer for them. Question number one, who are you? Who are you? What do you have to say about you? And it, we're usually all over the map. And let me just give you one sentence. If you have a pen, pencil, lipstick, mascara, please write it down. 
But one sentence I hope you remember about life. If you don't believe you bring value, it's probably going to be a unanimous conclusion. If you don't believe you have something to offer, it'll be unanimous. Most folks will come to the same conclusion. Now, I'm going to talk to you in just a few moments about how we deal with pride and haughtiness and thinking more of ourselves than we should. But I believe a biblical self-image is when you love the Lord, your God, with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and you love your neighbor and esteem others just as highly as you esteem yourself. I don't believe because I'm a devoted, passionate follower of Jesus that I have to go through life thinking less of myself. I think if I'm a devoted, passionate follower of Jesus, I just have to think about myself less, and there's a big difference. I want, I'm going to ask you to write it down. I'm going to ask you to write it in your mind and your heart. If I don't bring value to whatever my assignment is, if I don't feel like I add anything, then no one else is going to feel like you add anything either. So we need a baptism of the calling of God upon our life. Now, I was junkie, six broken homes, physical abuse, sexually abused, hair to my waist, dropped out of school twice, in and out of detention center, foster homes, methamphetamine junkie, you know, DNF student, 13 colleges turned me down, 13 colleges said, no thanks. The army said, no, we got it covered. We had a little something called Vietnam. And uh, <laughs> it didn't really bother me so much that I didn't take it personal until I saw Forrest Gump. <laughs> uh, run, Forrest, run. No, Jay, we got it covered. I mean, so I, I want you to know when the Lord called me, I certainly didn't walk in the room thinking I added a lot of value. So I'm talking about in Christ. I'm talking about when you allow the Lord to do what he longs to do. And here you are, one of the elite seminaries on the planet, preparing yourself. But I hope and pray that when you wade through all these assignments and these unbelievable book reports and these unbelievable, and on and on, you know how it is. No matter how gifted a faculty may be, you know how tiring it is. They know who are doing it to you. They know how tiring it is because they went through it themselves. But I promise you, see yourself in Christ and the value. And you've got to make every day count. I wish you'd write down another sentence. The future belongs to those who are prepared. And that's job one here, to get you ready to get in the game. You know, and please don't get caught up in all the little side issues all the little theological debates that we talk about at, at uh, Starbucks, you know, and, and all the latest little fads. Come on, this stuff comes and goes. But I want you to understand, you've got to prepare yourself for the future. And the little boy sit down and a man stand up. And the little girl sit down and a woman stand up. And give this everything you have. Because if you prepare yourself for the future, I promise you, the Lord will put you in arenas you never dreamed you'd be able to go in. I promise you. I'm living proof. 13 schools said no thanks. Do you know now all 13 of those schools have either invited me to come and be on faculty. Two of them have asked me to come be president. <laughs> 11 of them are partners with Student Leadership University. They pay money to help us do what we do. And those 13 schools turned, uh, and first invited me to come back and speak. I said that to a reporter. She said, I bet it felt good to turn them down. I said, are you out of your mind? I went to every one of those places. And I spoke. And when I got through, I said, your mama. Because that's, I'm just that kind of guy. Okay? So I, please know when I talk to you about you got to feel you bring something to the party. You bring something to the dance. You bring something to the meeting. You've add a lot. Please know I was a guy that had nothing, added nothing. It's in Christ. And when he gives you a chance to be at a place like this, I'd be SpongeBob SquarePants. I mean, I would soak everything I can for 20 miles around. Who are you? Who are you really? So, 
If you don't believe you add value, no one else will. You've got to be able to speak for yourself. Your life by your preparation is going to give you the opportunity to do exceedingly abundantly beyond anything you can even imagine. Question one, who am I? Why am I here? Question two, why am I doing what I'm doing? And I promise you this, I promise you this. If you're faithful in little things, you get a chance to be faithful over big things. Now, I get asked to speak sometimes to 30, 40 different pro teams a year. I spent years speaking to the FCA group at a middle school seven hours outside of Dallas that no one cared about. I spent my life, 10,000 public school assemblies, never took a nickel for it. Speaking to young people about the battle for the mind and the battle for the body and keep your pants on and, and, and it's not how you start, but it's how you finish. And then they'd come that night and there'd be a big pizza party and I'd give my testimony and we'd be in the football field. I did that for 25, 30 years. I promise you what you do when no one's looking gets rewarded publicly. If I'm faithful, and by the way, can I be straight up with you? If I do my best with you today, if I believe this is a God-given appointment today, if I, if I really pour into you today, then I believe God gives me another opportunity to do something tomorrow. You purchase your tomorrow today. And that doesn't start after you get the paper. That doesn't start when your name's on the wall or on the sign out front. Are, are your tweets one everybody's following? Or your blog is the talk of the moment? No, no. It starts now. It starts now. Who am I? Why am I doing what I'm doing? And the third question you've got to ask and be able to answer, is there something or someone bigger than me in life? Because that something or someone is going to motivate you while you're in school and you're too tired to keep your head up and while you're struggling with class. Listen, I'm dyslexic, very dyslexic. They labeled me A D D D D D D D. <laughs> they said I was attention deficit disorder deliberately and I made disciples. That's what they said about me. They said if I was in the room, I didn't pay attention and nobody paid attention. <laughs> now, who in their right mind would take a junkie? Six broken homes, dropped out of school twice, in two gangs, dyslexic, A D D D D D, and make him take Greek, <laughs> Hebrew. Now, I don't want to brag. I'm more qualified than most of the professors here. I've had every Greek class you can have, some of them six times. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not bragging, I'm just saying, you know, so. If you need to know something, ask me, all right? Six times, I got it. Steel trap, all right? It's cruel and unusual punishment. Some of us, you're wading through stuff right now, and you, the hymn that comes to mind is, Help Me, Rhonda. I mean, because <laughs> it makes no sense. But I promise you, I promise you, payday's coming. When there'll be that moment, something you learn, some obscure, random thing, and it comes up, and you make that suggestion or that observation, and the Holy Spirit of God uses that to change somebody's life. I remember I had to read Russian lit. I had to go through Russian lit in college. And I never knew that I'd be standing in front of the Politburo. Three different occasions. Quoting stuff that I no more knew, and the Holy Spirit brought it back to mind. Listen, I promise you. So please know, who am I? Why am I here? And is there someone, something, captures my mind, captures my heart, fires me up, even now, so that the day will come, you're going to be able to run and not walk. We all talk about that day that we walk, yes, but we walk now so that what? We can run. And I promise it's coming. Now, let's get to the good stuff. You ready? John the Baptist. Who are you? Well, the Bible says in John 1, verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. Now, he was not that light, but was simply sent to bear witness of that light. 
And that was the light which gives light to every man coming into the world. In verse 19 of John 1, now this is the testimony of John, who the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny. I am not the Christ. They said, well, what then? Are you Elijah? I am not. Are you the prophet? I am not. And then they said to him, who are you? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? What do you say about yourself? Listen to what he said. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. And now there were also those sent from the Pharisees, and they said, well, why then do you baptize? Well, in other words, why are you doing what you're doing? If you're not the Christ, you're not Elijah, you're not the prophet, who are you? Why are you doing now what you're doing? And he goes on to talk about, I'm baptizing with water. But there comes one after me who is greater than I, who will baptize with fire. I'm not even worthy to loose the latch on his sandal. These things were done at Beth Barber, beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. Look down, if you would, verse 35. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, looking at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. So let's talk about these three questions. You ready? Why is it imperative that you be able to answer once and for all, Who are you? Who am I? And there's great benefits that come from knowing. Number one, please get this. When you really know who you are, you don't have to pretend to be who you're not. And we spend a lot of our time, even at our age, even at cemetery, seminary. So <laughs> that wasn't a, that joke so old that I, I'm ashamed that I even know it, that joke so old. But that was a slip, sorry. In seminary, please understand we play games even while we're here. We worry what everybody thinks about us while we're here. And can I be real candid with you? And this is for free. Probably won't even get an A on homiletics because I'm going to spend a moment on this because the Lord just brought it to mind. But I, I wish you'd write down something for me. Write this down because you forget 80 to 85% of what you hear if you don't write it down. That's a fact. I know because... Uh, I wrote it down, I wrote it down uh, last night, and I remember. <laughs> so I want you to hear me now. Do you realize when we talk about pretending who you are, we worry so much about what others say, that's number one, or others think, and then number two, we also then get around at center, and we'll be more excited about spending time with somebody on the faculty than we do a classmate, or somebody that speaks at chapel than somebody we see every day. Can I show you one of the greatest, most neglected leadership lessons on the planet? And I get paid a lot of money to teach what I'm about to teach you. Not near what I'm worth, but a lot, all right? <laughs> the ability to build meaningful, lasting relationships. I preached, I may be off one or two, 24, 23, 24 years in a row at the Southern Baptist Convention. That, at the time, was more than Adrian Rogers, more than Jerry Vines, more than Charles Stanley. Now, how, come on, how did that happen? Is it because I'm a greater preacher? No. no. <laughs> I, even I couldn't do that with a straight face. No, of course not. It's relationships. I served, was friends with, partnered with, labored with men who were in ministries all over the country in all these crusades. And I went all day, every day, and I went all night and I spent time with their kids and I served every way I knew how. And God began to promote a lot of those guys. And when it came time for them and they had some influence and they were asked, who would you recommend to be a part of a program? Who do you think could speak on this? Who do you think could speak on that? I got opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. It's amazing all the folks say, how in the world did you do that? How in the world? I have no clue. Those were friends. Those were co-laborers. Those were brothers that we had done life with and ministry with. 
I'll spend the night with my best friend in ministry, a guy named Jack Graham tonight. I knew Jack Graham when he was at a church the size of this section right here in Oklahoma. And can I tell you something? He's a great leader. He's the same guy I was there. Loves God, all in, gives it everything he's got. And you just, so I just want to say, don't step over some of the greatest resources, greatest encouragement, greatest friends you'll ever have in your life. Right here at school. And you know what? I'm grateful those that went to school with me or heard me share or maybe get to speak once in a while or we had coffee or we did whatever and and I asked questions and they helped me and I tried to help them. I'm grateful that they then said when they had an opportunity, whether it was a youth group or a high school or, or, or a church or a crusade, they all said, I met a guy. I want you to bring him. I think he'll do a great job. His name is Jay. You see how that works? But I promise you, I go to all these meetings and all these conferences and all these, and I watch you scramble to be with everybody and the brother. And sometimes there's people sitting right next to you that'll be your best friend for 30 years. And then along the way, may help, God may use them to give you more opportunity. And by the way, you think people can tell if you're just wanting to be around them because you think they can do something for you? They can tell that. So I want you to understand the ability to build meaningful, lasting relationships. John, who are you? When you know who you are, you don't have to pretend to be who you're not. Number two, when you know who you are, you have internal anchors inside you that keeps you from getting swept away. It was pretty heady stuff. You know, John the Baptist had disciples before Jesus came. When John walked in the room, everybody said, John's here. When John left, they went, John left the building. John was standing on the side of the, on the bank with his disciples when he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And those disciples left John and went and followed Jesus. And you know what John did when Jesus stepped up? John took several steps back. John was the man before Jesus. But he said, I must decrease so that he can increase. That's pretty heady stuff. Are you the Christ? No. Are you sure? Yeah, pretty pretty sure. I'm John. Think I'd be wearing this outfit if I was the Christ? I mean, you know, come on. Right? Years ago when I was living in Dallas, we had a horrible situation. Horrible situation in Waco. We had a guy named David Koresh. Remember all that in Waco? And this guy claimed to be Jesus. Come back, the second coming of Jesus. And I was interviewed on one of the local stations. What did I think about his claim? And I said, well, do you have any pictures of him? And they flashed on the monitor. I said, this is the funniest thing I've ever heard. I said, this guy's wearing socks with sandals. You know right now that's not Jesus come back if he's wearing (laughs) socks with sandals. Hello, are you the Christ? John's going, I don't think so, but it was. But when you know who you are, you don't have to get caught up And are you Elijah? No. Are you Jeremiah? No, I'm John. I'm John. Last of all, please write this down. When you know who you are, you don't have to settle for being an echo. You can be a voice. Some people, when you hear them speak, you're really hearing them, you know who they've talked to last. We have a lot of echoes. Everybody's reading the right blog, the right tweet. I mean, you know, you know how to, I mean, that's life. I mean, there's nothing we can do about that. But I'm just saying, I don't want to be an echo. I'd like to be a voice. John said, who are you, John? I'm a voice preparing the way. If I were you, I'd want to know who I am then why are you doing what you're doing, John? Why are you baptizing? And you know what he said? I am preparing the way for Jesus, for the Messiah. I want you to turn quickly. The last passage we'll be able to see in the Gospel of Luke chapter 3. We have the same story. John's baptizing in the Jordan. Jesus comes. And John the Baptist, it says, and according to the book of Isaiah the prophet, John was preaching. Luke 3 verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain shall be brought low. The crooked paths 
shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth and all the flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. So when you know who you are, when you know why you're doing what you're doing, then you're going to start preparing yourself to prepare the way. Listen to what John knew. He knew that you have to make the path straight. He knew that every valley has to be filled, every mountain has to be brought low, the crooked places made straight, the rough areas made smooth. Spurgeon, and no, I didn't go to school with him, but Spurgeon (laughs) fell in love with the preaching of John the Baptist. And he often referenced John the Baptist as the forerunner. He just used that term. If you read much of Spurgeon, the forerunner, the forerunner, the forerunner. Do you know what John the Baptist got right? He had to prepare himself in order to help prepare the way. John knew he had to make sure his path was straight. He knew that every valley had to be filled. Now, you know the great analogy, the heralds go announcing the king is coming, the king is coming, and sure as that custom, both in the Orient and the Occident, whenever a royalty would come, whenever a king would come, they would go before him, and if there were real high mountains, they brought them down and leveled them. And if there was a great ravine, and you'd have to usually take four or five days to go around, no, they would have folks go and in advance make straight and fill up that ravine so that the king could get there quickly. And if there were rough spots in the road, they filled them up and they removed the stones, they removed the thistles and the thorns, and they removed the snakes. They made sure there were no crooks or criminals hiding, you know, somewhere where the king could be ambushed. In other words, they got it ready for the coming of the king. And John the Baptist said, I am fulfilling what Isaiah did. But here's what John did. He got himself right before he could get anybody else right. Now I wanna ask you a couple hard questions because, I mean, there's nobody here but us girls, right? Nobody here but us, so we can talk. I said, now you're supposed to believe you bring something to the party, you're supposed to think good of yourself, that you have value, that God has a plan for you, you're called, but can I be honest with you, before you can experience that, we gotta do this. Because don't try to be the one preparing the way if you're not willing to prepare yourself. What crooked path in our life needs to be made straight? We've got these valleys. Now, what are the valleys? Well, Spurgeon said that what one must do if he wants divine fellowship is to fill in and and get rid of these valleys of self-doubt, groveling, low thinking of yourself because inevitably it leads to low thinking of God. And some of us don't feel we're worthy, even in the ministry. And that indicates that relationship with him is not what it should be. If you've got a valley, the self-doubts and the fears and the trepidations and, the, and you're, you're just paralyzed sometimes, We've got to fill that valley. And then on the other hand, what do we have? You got folks that are full of ego. They're not only self-seeking, they're full of self-sufficiency. And that's the only way to explain the prayerlessness and the lack of real hunger for time with God and fellowship with him. So Spurgeon talked about how John the Baptist would lay an ax to the root of the problem. So before you and I can have any dreams of being used to prepare the business world or young people or a church or a pastor or a mission field, before we can even dream of that, let's get the path straight. Let's fill the valley. And if we've got some mountains of self-sufficiency and ego and self, let's level those. I mean, we got a lot of divas running around wearing pants. You know that, don't you? We got a lot of divas in pants. 
we got a lot of preachers and a lot of folks think awfully highly of themselves. I met some guys the other day and I suggested they go to the Disney boutique. It's called the Bippity Boppity Boo. And uh, when you go, they dress you up like one of the princesses and they fix your hair and your makeup and, and you know, because they just kind of had that air about. Come on. So we get, we, you know, peacock one day, feather duster the next. Please remember that. Please remember that. That's a good one, Dr. John. I know, that's a good one. Write it down. All right, peacock one day, feather duster the next. But you're going to have to bring low the mountains. The crooked paths made straight and the rough areas made smooth. How, how many times has somebody said about you, I know he's a good guy, I know he really loves the Lord, I know she's, she's got some potential, but boy, they got some rough spots. Has anybody said that about you? You don't even want to know what all they said about me. And they were right. And God put some professors in my life. And God put some friends in my life. And God brought family back into my life. And I promise you, the Lord is going to do in you, through you, for you, beyond anything you can imagine. But you've got to do what John did. I'm John. And I just want to prepare the way. And Lord, I know that means you've got to prepare me before I can prepare anyone else. John felt like there was something worth dying for. I close with this. Great quote from Will Rogers. All right? Will Rogers said, you know, we can't all be heroes. We can't all be heroes. And that's okay, because after all, somebody has to sit on the curb and clap when the heroes parade by. You ever been at a parade and a hero would go by, somebody important goes by and everybody just claps? Do you know John the Baptist was part of a nation? Israel had 400 silent years. You remember that wonderful section in church history, right? 400 silent years. You know why they were called that? Nothing happened. Everybody was sitting on the curb waiting for somebody else to stand. John the Baptist stood and shattered those 400 silent years. Got himself prepared and got Israel ready. The Lamb of God, he comes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to be sitting on the curb. I'm going to be real straight with you. I want God to use me. I long for him to use me. I want him to put me in. And I'd like to be given the ball when the game counts. And I'd like to be given an important assignment. And I'd like to be the one. And by the way, and please understand, you've got leaders in this room, they can tell you this. Do you know there's a lot of times that in the course of a day, I'll go to meetings that when I walk in the room, the meeting starts. I'm the one they're waiting for, for the meeting. I like those kind of meetings. <laughs> All right? Do you know... I'll have far more meetings in a day where I'm not the man. I'll have a lot of meetings where I'm one of the guys. And there's ladies in the room and men in that room, and we're peers. We're, we're burdeners. We've come together for a, a good, a project, a, a cause, right? And you know what I love about a room like that? I love being in a room with eagles. And somebody will say, you know, Bob, we want you to carry the ball. And Jay, we need you to block or I may be the guy going to the airport, or I may be the guy going to make sure the, the uh, audiovisual stuff is working. I love being a part. And you know what's good is when somebody turns to you, your peers, and go, we think you're the best one to carry the ball in this project. That's pretty exciting, right? When your peers go, man, of all of us, we want you to carry, we're here to help you, we're going to do it together. That's the way, that's what happened to Dr. Martin Luther King, youngest guy in the room, newest one in Birmingham. But they all looked at him and said, you're the guy. And then there's a lot of meetings where I'm setting up chairs and I'm helping and you know what I mean? So, you know, being a leader, you don't worry about a title. You don't worry about what's my responsibility. You know what you worry about? What can I do to make a difference? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, help us get up off the curb. Help us to be willing to make a stand and Lord, as John the Baptist humbled himself and prepared himself and just got alone with you and asked you to do that deep and abiding work, I pray you'd help us prepare ourselves so that we can prepare this generation. 
Thank you for the privilege of being at this incredible school, not just its heritage, but Lord, the fact that over 2,000 people are being trained right now today at this school. Lord, use them. Use them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, man. Let's thank Dr. Strack.